In a lot of ways, it feels like Texas was always destined for the SEC. They're the flagship university branch of one of the largest states in the United States, one whose pride in being Southern nearly overshadows the entirety of the American South. The point is that the Texas Longhorns, the most brash, vocal, and borderline the most successful athletics department in the proudest Southern state, was almost always destined for Southern Alliance. They weren't long for the Southwest once it became clear that staying within the Texas border wasn't economically viable, and they certainly never put roots down in the Big 12 Conference once they joined. They took every opportunity to look at leaving for a better option, with the Pac-10 in 2011, the Big 10 since then, and of course, now to their next destination, the SEC next season, dragging their rival Oklahoma with them. But 2020 wasn't the first time Texas had flirted with joining the South's premier college athletics conference. In fact, Texas's eventual SEC membership shouldn't really be that much of a surprise to anyone following Longhorn Athletics in the late 80s. While their original preferred destination was the academically inclined Pac-10, the Longhorns always had their eyes on Southern living. So, what if, during a period of realignment in 1989, the Longhorns decided to pull the trigger and join the SEC? What changes would that have had on them, or the SEC, or the Big 12? What would it have meant for college athletics or the NCAA in general? It's time we ask that question. What if Texas joined the SEC in 1989? To start this hypothetical, we have to see where Texas would have been interested in joining the SEC. And to do that, we have to go to a Sports Illustrated article from 2016. Deep in the possibility of adding two more teams to get to 12 way back when, the conversation around the Big 12, even from its inception, had been about the necessity of its expansion. From the possibility of adding New Mexico, BYU, Louisville, and Memphis in 1996, to its many flirtations with outside schools throughout the 2000s, to its losses and additions past 2011. Through it all, though, the University of Texas had a large amount of say. Given its standing as a university, even going so far as to near single-handedly deny Louisville admission into the conference in 2011. It was, as former Texas Chancellor Bill Cunningham put it, the pretty girl everyone wanted to date. But as far back as 1980, Texas was having doubts about its future. The fallout from 1984's Oklahoma vs. NCAA decision had rendered the College Football Association nearly meaningless by the turn of the 90s, and as conferences began negotiating television contracts, those schools who could move to better situations, most of them independents, decided they would to better their chances of having a solid future. Arkansas, then in the Southwest Conference, did just that in 1990, joining the SEC and rendering the Southwest just about worthless as a television conference, considering 100% of their viewing area resided inside the state of Texas. The SEC itself saw expansion and the creation of divisions in a conference championship game as its way into running the future of college sports. According to Ben Portney at the state, the conference didn't even make the decision to expand until 1990 after the Big Ten's bombshell decision to add Penn State in 1989 was starting to come to the surface. If they wanted to be on top, they had to go past 11. They had to add two schools. Arkansas's decision to join the SEC spurred the conference to add South Carolina in response, creating the first 12-team power conference in 1990. The independent Gamecocks, while not as distinctive a brand as the Razorbacks, were in financial trouble per Alan Piercy of Gamecock Central and needed to join a conference to bail them out. Luckily for them, the SEC was interested for two primary reasons. One, they couldn't grab either of the big two Texas schools who wanted to stay in the Southwest in our timeline, and two, they didn't really want to add either of those schools if they already added Arkansas because they wanted to expand both West and East. That's why they focused on Miami, Florida State, and South Carolina's potential options instead of trying to convince A&M and Texas to leave the Southwest. By adding Arkansas, the SEC closed their doors to the Western Longhorns and looked east. But this almost wasn't a problem. The Razorbacks joined the SEC in 1990, but the SEC had kicked the tires on Texas before then, almost a full year prior. According to that Sports Illustrated roundtable, Texas Chancellor Cunningham was approached by SEC figureheads, namely Georgia President Chuck Knapp, in Washington, D.C. to inquire about the Longhorns' interest in leaving the Southwest and joining the SEC a full year before Arkansas's decision was made. Texas fans wanted out of the state, and by 1990, the SEC was beginning its climb to the peak of college football hierarchies. But due to Texas's interest in academics, top members of the Longhorn brass always preferred the Big Ten or the Pac-10 over the SEC. Cunningham himself said that the SEC wasn't heavily considered. 
what's happened since then is in the history books. The Razorbacks and Gamecocks have struggled to separate themselves from the rest of the SEC in football, and aside from a few good seasons in men's and women's basketball respectively, they've played second, third, or even fourth fiddle to teams like Kentucky, Tennessee, and even occasionally Florida, Auburn, and Alabama. Culturally, the schools are a great fit, but they haven't really blown the conference wide open. Now go back to Texas. The Longhorns remained near the top of competition in the Big 12 South, competing with rival Oklahoma year in and year out in football until Mack Brown left the program in 2013, after which they wandered in the wilderness until just recently with their hiring of Steve Sarkeesian. They've been consistent competitors in other sports, like baseball and basketball, and are widely considered to have one of the better athletic departments overall, but are still known for being disappointments in the Big 12. In a conference they supposedly kept on life support, the Longhorn football team, the university's pride, failed to win a conference championship in football from 2009 to 2023. Ironically enough, the Longhorns too struggled in the Big 12 in general, hoping their recent rise in athletic department prominence will carry them into the SEC this year on a high note. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention that? Uh, they're joining the SEC anyway. They and Oklahoma both announced their intentions to leave the Big 12 for the SEC in 2020 after an expose was released by then Texas A&M athletic director Ross Bjork. The SEC voted unanimously to accept both squads, leading to most of the conference realignment we've seen since then. Super conferences are where the money's at right now. But what if Bill Cunningham had listened to Chuck Knapp in 1989 instead of sticking with the Southwest and hurried to join the SEC before Arkansas could in 1990? What would have happened to the Longhorn program if that had happened? What about the SEC or the Big 12? College sports as we know it today. Let's just say, for the sake of hypotheticals, that Cunningham and the SEC worked in secret to incorporate the Longhorns into the conference. They would have done this for a multitude of reasons, but the majority of these would be to prevent some folks from getting really, really angry. Arkansas had practically begged for inclusion into the SEC, and if their invitation was rescinded because of a bigger program in the conference they were leaving taking it, it would likely create a storm of anger from Razorback Brass. They were leaving for the SEC in 1990, largely in part due to Texas's domineering. If the Longhorns maneuvered out from under them and stole their spot, things would not be pretty in Fayetteville. Arkansas wouldn't have been the only one angry. While Texas was vocal about its insistence in joining the Pac-10 during the Southwest final days, Texas A&M was vocal in its infatuation with the SEC. Both schools ended up in the Big 12, largely because of an idea that Texas and A&M were, quote, tied to the hip. If Texas had severed this tie early to take a spot in A&M's Dream Conference as far back as 1989, things inside the state regencies would have gotten angry fast. And that would have been the case for all of the dying Southwest members, not just A&M and Arkansas. The impending collapse of the Southwest famously sent every university's president into a race for lifeboats, with only Texas, A&M, Tech, and Baylor finding one. But that decision was made in 1996. Texas's departure here seven years earlier than in real life, would have been a total surprise, totally blindsiding and killing the conference early. That would have created a tidal wave of changes from our timeline. Firstly, Texas's decision to join the SEC in 1989 would have prevented Arkansas from even being considered for SEC membership, given the conference wanted to add a Western and an Eastern university to their ranks. With Texas taking the Western spot, that would leave Florida State, Miami, and South Carolina as their top options for expansion after that, just like in real life. It's possible that adding such a premier brand as the Longhorns in 1989 would have convinced Florida State to set aside their personal wants and choose to join the now football super conference SEC as opposed to the ACC in 1991. In fact, with Texas's admission into the SEC likely being made public as soon as it was agreed upon and scheduling being done to move them into the conference as soon as possible, likely in 1990, the rest of the college sports world likely panics in order to keep up with the SEC. With the SEC adding Texas in 1990 and likely Florida State in 1991, the ACC is now left with either Miami or South Carolina as potential options, with the likelihood being that they choose to readmit the Gamecocks back into the conference. Miami still probably chooses to join the Big East in this scenario, but it's possible they join the ACC too. With 12-team leagues being clearly the way of the future, other leagues would have tried to catch up. There's a high probability that the now 11-team Big Ten Conference kicks the tires heavily on Notre Dame, doing everything they can to recruit the Fighting Irish into their league. If the SEC is scary enough, they might just have succeeded. For the sake of this hypothetical, though, I'm going to say that the Irish still choose independence. But what about the Southwest and Big Eight? 
In our timeline, the conference pushed hard for Texas and A&M to join the league to get to 10 schools, only adding Tech and Baylor after some consideration was made to get a conference championship game. But with a conference championship game now clearly necessary, the Big 8 knows from the jump in 1990 that it needs to add four more schools. They had been communicating with Texas and A&M since the early 1990s, but with this change in the timeline, they get a little more proactive to keep their place in the college world. Lucky for them, Texas's departure has set the Southwest on fire even more so than it was with the departure of Arkansas in real life. But it will look different than it did in our 1996, with the likelihood being that it forms earlier, sometime around 1992. Given that 1992 estimate, we know that the Big 12 will look a little different in this timeline. The top two options for expansion were clearly Texas A&M and Arkansas, who, without Texas in the picture, would be the premier universities left in the Southwest Conference. Texas Tech would likely also be safe as a third option to bring into the league. But the fourth spot going to Baylor isn't quite set in stone, especially if we go back to the Sports Illustrated article. You see, according to former Texas Senator and Baylor grad David Sibley, he and a group of former Texas Tech grads went to the Texas legislature and Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock, a Baylor grad, to push for the admission of Tech and Baylor to the Big 12 as well as Texas and A&M in 1994. But in this timeline, with the Big 12 wanting to mobilize in 1992, Bullock would not have been Lieutenant Governor in that seat. William P. Hobby Jr. would have been, and Hobby was a graduate of Rice who was born in Houston, Texas. As former Missouri and Oklahoma Athletic Director Joe Castiglione put it, it almost wasn't Baylor that joined the Big 12 in 1996, but Houston. In this timeline, it's the Cougars that get the last lifeline out of the Southwest, not Baylor. So the Big 12 is likely formed in 1993 or 1994, with members Iowa State, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, Kansas State, Colorado, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Arkansas, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, and Houston. And if not Houston, then TCU or Baylor with some conversations around adding BYU, New Mexico, Louisville, and Memphis State circulating but eventually not coming to fruition like in real life. But how does this affect some of the individual schools involved here? Let's start with Texas since they're the main mover in this video. In 1989, the Longhorn football program was led by head coach David McWilliams to a disappointing 5-6 and six season in the Southwest. The next season under McWilliams, though, they improved to 10-2, going undefeated in the Southwest. Their two losses were to the eventual national champion in Colorado and to Miami, but their loss to Miami was by a staggering 43 points in the Cotton Bowl. At the end of 1990, there were only three ranked teams in the Southwest, with Houston and A&M being the other two. Had the Longhorns been in the SEC, it's likely that they would have been placed in an SEC West with an LSU team that finished 5-6, and six, an Ole Miss team that finished 9-3, and three, a Mississippi State team that went 5-6, and six, and an Auburn that went 8-3-1, and one, and an Alabama that went 7-5. and five. That Longhorn team probably loses one or two games in the SEC West that they don't lose in the Southwest. The rest of the 90s are interesting for Texas, considering they continued to disappoint under McWilliams and eventually brought in John McAvick in 1992, who also underperformed until the Longhorns hired Mac Brown in 1998. It's hard to tell if they would have succeeded in an SEC West that likely includes LSU, Alabama, and Auburn. An SEC Longhorns team would likely want a more Southern-minded coach to coach in the SEC as opposed to McAvick, so instead, they'd likely sign an up-and-comer, like Howard Schnellenberger or Tennessee's Phil Fulmer, who had been the interim coach at Tennessee and had had some success there, or potentially they'd be able to price someone away with a large enough paycheck, like potentially Steve Spurrier, or an NFL coach like Dave Wanstead, who was with the Dallas Cowboys in 1992. It's not likely they pick up the phone for the defensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns, though. Uh, not this time. Regardless of who their coach was, it's likely that Texas slowly grows to become an ascendant power in the SEC West, on par with LSU by the turn of the millennium. In fact, it's likely that Texas and LSU form quite a formidable rivalry in just the 10 years from 1990 to 2000, considering they were the nearest to each other in conference without primary rivals in division. It's not unlikely that their arms race culminates in LSU replacing Jerry DiNardo as their head coach earlier than 1999. If they did this in, say, 1998, when they went 4-7, it's likely they'd target someone with a championship pedigree, like Florida State Offensive Coordinator Mark Richt. That might shut the door on LSU hiring Nick Saban away from Michigan State, leading Saban to go elsewhere, potentially Austin, Texas. But again, that's all semantics. I fully expect Texas and LSU to be the cream of the crop in the West by 2000, due solely to their arms race trying to outdo each other in football. Alabama's slow decline would have been exacerbated by Texas being in their division. 
I doubt that Texas would have taken over the SEC, especially with the other schools in conference, but they definitely would have made some noise. But what about the gaping hole they left in the Big 12? For starters, Houston would have taken Baylor's spot as the kicked horse of the Big 12 conference, especially under Kim Helton and Dana Dimmel. Those teams were not good, and I can't imagine they'd be that much better in a division with Arkansas and Oklahoma as opposed to Southern Miss. They might go a different direction with coaches earlier than they did in real life, hopefully never touching the mud that is Art Bryles, but they likely do follow a similar path to Baylor, not really becoming much of a consistent competitor in the Big 12 South until the early 2010s. Texas A&M becomes the second pillar in the Big 12 South with Texas gone, which doesn't really change much aside from their program likely maintaining some of its distinction without the Longhorns constantly vying to steal the spotlight. If anything, Texas Tech actually benefits the most from Texas not joining the Big 12, as they become A&M's number one rival in conference, elevating both schools. That's not to say Arkansas doesn't fit into the Big 12. They do. Well. Games against Oklahoma and Oklahoma State become statewide holidays in both states, and in a league without Eastern focus, Arkansas as a school is able to focus on recruiting Texas and Missouri, meaning they get different recruits and the identity of the team changes to be more like, say, those really good Oklahoma State teams. Most importantly, Arkansas probably wins the Big 12 a handful of times without having to wrestle LSU or Alabama for a spot in the conference championship. It's entirely possible that joining the Big 12 in the early 90s would have actually benefited their program in the long run. In the years since Arkansas's addition to the SEC, many Razorback fans have been wondering if the lack of prestige might have been worth it. It's not as crazy as it seems, especially considering Arkansas was interested in joining the Big 8 as far back as the 70s, according to former Big 8 Commissioner Chuck Nanus, and there was a very real smoke around them leaving the SEC to join the Big 12 in 2010, just ask Jerry Jones. Culturally and geographically, they're far closer to Oklahoma than Louisiana. It's entirely possible Arkansas may not have just been happy in the Big 12 after losing out on an SEC invite, but content, clear until the 2010s, especially if they won a lot. Now what about the rest of the Big 12? Well, I can't get into the weeds of it too much without making this video an hour long. I'll just say, for no reason at all, that the butterfly effect causes Kansas State to play Arkansas in the 1998 Big 12 championship game instead of Texas A&M, and they win because I say so, and they beat Tennessee to win the national championship. No, I will not be elaborating on my reasoning. Source is trust me, bro. Immediately, though, this brings up questions about the 2010 realignment. I find it difficult to believe that the SEC would be willing to just sit on its laurels in realignment just because Texas and Florida State had been in the league for 20 years. In real life, once Nebraska left for the Big Ten, the SEC targeted Missouri and Texas A&M to expand to 14 schools. But an interesting thing comes to mind here. While it's clear Nebraska, Missouri, and Texas A&M left the Big 12 for bigger paychecks and other conferences, their stated reason for defection was always the same. Texas. Nebraska notoriously hated the domineering Texas had over the Big 12 despite being newcomers, and Texas A&M leapt at the first chance to join the SEC so they could get out from Texas's shadow. With the Longhorns no longer in the Big 12, it's entirely possible those schools aren't as antsy to leave the Big 12 in the first place. Colorado's departure still likely happened since the Pac-10 would still be looking to go to 12 even if the Pac-16 wasn't a viable proposition in the alternate timeline. But without Texas there to shoot it down, the Big 12 likely jumps on the first opportunity to add Louisville to the conference. According to Barry Trammell at The Oklahoman, Texas was reportedly the loudest voice against adding the Cardinals in 2011. With the Longhorns out of the conference, Louisville probably safely makes it into the Big 12. They weren't the only options considered, with the probability of adding West Virginia and Pitt alongside Louisville also possible. In this scenario, I'm going to assume that Oklahoma and Arkansas decide to leave for the SEC in 2011. Arkansas would have built their brand up considerably, and Oklahoma would try to rejoin their longtime rivals in the SEC. While this move might seem to cripple the Big 12 Conference, and it certainly hurts now that they're left with just nine members, it makes sense that they would add more. Pitt and West Virginia make sense as additions, but I can see the Big 12 also deciding to push even further and add TCU and potentially BYU as a football-only affiliate. Really, with Texas and the SEC, anything can happen realignment-wise. What would the ACC do? With Florida State gone, it could be assumed that they raid the Big East earlier and for more schools. Maybe they eliminate that avenue from the Big 12 and add West Virginia, Pitt, Miami, and Boston College as early as the late 90s. How about Rutgers? UConn? Is this the alternate universe where USF becomes a Power 5 school? But what about the schools themselves? 
Does Texas win more national championships or less? Does Alabama or LSU land Nick Saban at all? Can I find an alternate universe where Bill Snyder wins the natty he deserved? So much can happen or change due to one event altering a timeline. But here's where I'll kick it to you. What do you think would have happened if Texas decided to join the SEC in 1989? Would the SEC have changed considerably if the Longhorns booted either Arkansas or South Carolina, or both, from conference spots? What would have happened to the Big 12 or ACC? Do super conferences arrive faster in this timeline than in ours? Let me know in the comments below. As always, be safe out there. I'll see you next time.